Hello, everyone. Welcome to the November episode of Perspective Live, an initiative by Colleges and Institutes Canada, where we share different perspectives on what matters to you. Today's episode asks the question, are we moving the needle on climate change? I'm Manjula Selvaraja and delighted to be your host for the season. Before we get started, I wish to acknowledge that this episode of Perspectives Life is being produced and broadcast from the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. CI Can would like to recognize the ongoing contributions of its corporate partners, um, Avis Budget, Field Effect, and TD, who support CICAN's activities, including bringing you this show, as well as this month's show sponsor, corporate partner BGIS. And here's a word from BGIS President Mike Gradenis. Hi there, I'm Mike Gradenis, President of BGIS Canada. The future of our climate depends on our actions of today. As an integrated facility management company, managing over 24,000 locations across Canada, we believe that as an organization, we must take action, we must become advocates, and we must make significant changes to protect our planet. We are proud to partner with organizations like CICAN, who are also committed to truly moving the needle when it comes to climate change. BGS has stayed true to our value of living sustainability. For example, we've continued to expand our energy efficiency, our sustainability programs that support our clients in reducing their waste and carbon emissions across their portfolios. Through initiatives like our Connected Buildings Program, Continuous Recommissioning Projects, and Net Zero Engineering, BGS has been able to not only save our customers money for reinvestment, but significantly reduce their carbon footprint, mitigating climate change. Thanks for joining this Perspective Lives series session. Thanks you and BGIS for the support and commitment to colleges and institutes and this conversation. Now I'd like to invite CICAN President and CEO, Denise Amio, to join me for a quick conversation. Denise, hello. Hello, how are you doing? I am well and you look splendid in red. Can I just say that? <laughs> Thank you. So let me ask you this. I, I find this topic fascinating, but, but tell me, why is it so important for CICAN to have a show on, on this topic? Uh, you know what? It is a topic that has been of interest to colleges and institutes for years, since 1972, in fact. And we know uh, that we cannot work on this alone. We, we need to work in collaborations and partnerships with different sectors of society, whether it's the communities that are around the colleges, the nonprofit organizations, the business sector, or even the different levels of government. And that's why today we uh, wanted to hear experts that come from different fields to uh, get to know from them what is the state of the situation right now and to to give us some insights of what else should we be doing and how should we be doing it amazing well i really want you to weigh in on our panel in about half an hour you'll be back with us thank you denise uh, denise will it will be joined then by angus graham the president of selkirk college and nidu jagoda uh, a student on CI CAN's Impact Advisory Committee and National Coordinator with the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Um, that'll be in half an hour, but let me kick off our first panel. I'm super excited to introduce our panelists. Um, Justine, Justine Hendricks is Senior Vice President and Chief Corporate Sustainability Officer at Export Development Canada. Rick Smith is President of the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices and Catherine Abro is founder and executive director of Destination Zero and also a part of the Net Zero advisory body. Um, hello. Hi, hello. Okay. Thank you all for being here. I know that um, all three of you actually were in Scotland for, for COP26. And, and I know some of you just got back very recently and you've been sort of thinking through through everything that happened there. So, so Justine, I'm going to start off with you. Um, you know, before we get into the details, paint us a picture of, of what it was like to be there. I mean, the eyes of the world are on you. There are thousands of participants. There's heated negotiations going on in rooms. And all of this is happening in the midst of a pandemic. 
No, no, thanks for, for asking. And I have to uh, admit, I'm still, uh, I, I'm probably still taking it all in, to be honest, mm. right? It was uh, certainly for me the first trip in two years and, and to be at the, the World Conference around climate was, uh, was really exciting. Uh, you know, to be honest, I think it was exciting. Um, it was great to kind of see the vibe that was going on in Scotland. Um, you know, the city of Glasgow uh, and the UK government did a fantastic job to keep everybody safe. Um, you know, uh, demonstrations were uh, peaceful. Everybody was kind of, I shouldn't say in harmony, but, you know, people had their place to speak their voice while there was all sorts of different activities. So you walk away from an event like that and the grandness of it saying, wow, like it, it was it was pretty exciting, right? So you walk away really being inspired. And as you're coming home on, on the flight back to say, okay, I wanna get going on what's next. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think that's what there was so much coverage of it here, at least well, depending on who you talk to, either too much coverage or too little coverage, but certainly coverage. And I think um, that's what people are thinking now. What happens next after hearing all of these uh, these announcements? You know, Catherine, I get the sense that that Canada um, felt some level of momentum going into COP26, but also there was a sense of humility because of how tied our economy is to to fossil fuels. Did this this massive event in Scotland, did it move the needle for Canada? Uh, thanks, Manjula, and, and great to be here with all of you having this uh, conversation today. So, you know, I think it's true that um, it is exciting to, to be on the heels of this first in-person meeting uh, that many of us have attended for a long time. Um, and of course, I think a big takeaway from COP26 is that nations came away really united in this desperate hope to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, but kind of divided on the scale of effort and the kinds of policies and measures that it's going to take to get us there. And Canada going into that conversation is coming from this really interesting place, right, where we've actually seen a really significant progression of climate policy in this country over the last six years, including the legislation of Canada's first uh, major and um, yeah, major climate law that is going to be bringing some predictability to the way Canada sets climate targets and takes action on those targets over time. We've got carbon pricing in Canada that uh, is a, a kind of world class example of carbon pricing. Um, and yet, our emissions in 2019 were basically the same as they were in 2005. And the largest source of emissions and largest growing source of emissions in the country is comes from our oil and gas sector. And so I do think that we had a really serious conversation about fossil fuels and the energy transition at COP26, more so than at any previous COP that I've been a part of at least. Uh, and Canada was a part of that conversation. And, I, and so I think it might be really interesting to unpack um, both the goals, the humility and the lessons that Canada has to take away from that conversation. So get into that with us. You know, what, what do you think? Um, what are some of those learnings for Canada from the event? Some takeaways, perhaps even some goals. Um, so a few years ago, the UN Environment Program, UNEP, started producing something called the Production Gap Report. Uh, it's paired with a report they've been publishing for many years called the Emissions Gap Report. Emissions Gap Report talks about the gap between our goals on limiting climate change and reducing greenhouse gas emissions and the actual effort that's been promised by countries. The production gap report, on the other hand, shows the gap between the effort that's been promised by countries and their plans for increasing the production of coal, oil, and gas. And that production gap report this year said, there are many countries in the world that produce fossil fuels, and some of them rely far less on the revenue from that production for their basic essential services than others. And so if we're thinking about a future where we need to be investing in that energy transition, phasing out the production and the use of fossil fuels over time, then those countries that are less reliant on those revenues need to be on the front lines of that phase out. And Canada is amongst mm -hmm. those. So while I think we as Canadians have the impression that our economy is very reliant on fossil fuels, and certainly that is the case for some provinces, overall, Canada is less reliant on that revenue than many other countries who will take longer to phase down their production of fossil fuels for that reason. And so I think that's maybe one of, one of the big takeaways that I have is like, 
what's the pace of that transformation that needs to happen in Canada so that we're doing our part in this global effort to transition away from fossil fuel dependence. And, and uh, you know, Rick, let me bring you in into this conversation here in, in terms of takeaways for Canada from uh, COP26. What would you say they were? Well, one of the things that struck me about, about COP is uh, the extent to which climate change has become an ordering principle for areas of policy uh, uh, where it's frankly been absent up until now. So, you know, a couple of quick examples, uh, you know, didn't get a lot of press at the time. A lot of the press around COP sort of focuses on the intrigue of it all, you know, what global leaders are going to show up. So I, I think sometimes uh, some of the significant moments uh, uh, are, uh, are, are, aren't noticed as much. Um, the EU and the US announced a, a global deal to decarbonize the very hard to decarbonize steel and aluminum industries and to aggressively use tariffs against countries that uh, don't get with that program. So, you know, all of a sudden climate change becomes uh, trade policy. Uh, there, was a, there was a very interesting deal between the US and the EU uh, to put together $8.5 billion for South Africa to uh, expedite South Africa phasing out its coal, coal-fired electricity plants uh, so all of a sudden, climate change starts to drive foreign aid policy. And then, you know, the last thing I'll say is very significant, significantly at this COP, we saw the private sector, we saw private capital aligning itself with net zero ambitions, with net zero commitments, you know, something, something in excess of $100 trillion of private capital saying, yeah, from now on, we're going to uh, be committed to net zero. You know, so yes, we need to see what the, those details look like. Yes, we need to see what that transparency looks like. But a very significant shift from the past where, you know, usually it was just environment ministers showing up at COPs. All of a sudden, it's the world's biggest corporations saying, uh, yeah, we're in and we're going to change the way we're doing things. Interesting. Um, uh you know, just, uh, Justine, I'd love for you to 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 weigh into on the on the idea of goals that were realized. Uh, wh what do you think you saw come to fruition, and 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 what are some of the things that you think? Um, I know that's a really large question to ask, but the things that bothered you that 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 um, that the in, the entire interaction fell short on. Yeah, no, no, that is a fairly large question. Maybe one of the things I'll add to the conversation is I think at COP, and, you know, I'll come at it from, you know, the role that EDC does or plays as an export credit agency. What we saw in the dialogue was um, the first time where we kind of saw um, trade financing come closer to development financing, right? Before they were kept very much separate. And I think uh, mm. Rick alluded to it quite well, right? Like now climate is is informing or influencing how governments operate and how they will influence as well as the financial services sector. So that I think is actually quite different. Now, you know, we could, we could uh, debate whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think for me, the biggest one uh, was around, you know, the fact that the recognition that you can't just look to government to solve the problem. You can't just look to the mm -hmm. private sector to solve the problem. Everybody has a part to play to be able to solve this. That is one thing I think that you know became loud and clear. I, I must admit, I'm not on. I'm I'm certainly not in the camp. Of, of individuals that would think that COP fell short, right? And, mm. uh, you know, I, I would uh, offer for your audience, you know, typically COP, you know, there's a whole workup and a build up to COP, lots of negotiations to prepare for specific announcements, sometimes prior to the event and sometimes at the event itself. But you know what? I think what happens over the next, I'll say six months or six years, that's when I think you see 
the success of COP26 come to life. And certainly, you know, if I look at the continued momentum that we've had since we've returned with our government counterparts internally here at EDC to say, okay, what are those things based on what was discussed that we have to land on rapidly to be able to engage with Canadian exporters, uh, I can assure you the momentum is only getting faster, right? Uh, 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 there's lots of urgency to be able to bring that clarity. And I think it's, it is a Canadian challenge, um, you know, and, and, and uh, some of my esteemed colleagues alluded it to you, like the uniqueness of our economy, um, you know, Canada's coming at the table with some humility, but we also have some pretty big problems to solve. I think the mm -hmm. definition of transition and how we're going to help Canada transition and not wait years to do it, but get involved now to bring industry to the table, I would say is perhaps from my humble perspective, like the top question on people's mind, and there is no one entity that can solve it. So let's go through some of the the developments that we heard about, and perhaps the ones that that uh, that we may have ignored. Perhaps they didn't sort of make it across the very large pond. Um, I, I'd love for all of you to weigh in on this. Rick, I'll start with you. What was the most underrated development at COP, uh, COP and, and what do you think was the most, perhaps even uh, the the alternate to that? What was the most overrated one? And I, I hope Rick. Oh, Rick, I think your mic is muted. There we go. That's got to be the okay. most used phrase of 2021. You're muted. <laughs> My apologies. I should know better by now. Uh, the uh, um, you know there were there were some very uh, interesting, huge nature announcements at COP. So at, at one point, I stumbled. I just honestly, I was trying to eat a sandwich and I stumbled into this uh, incredible press conference with four Latin American presidents hooking up massive new marine protected areas in the Pacific, which will have mm -hmm. uh, big uh, carbon sequestration benefits in addition to all sorts of benefits for wildlife and what have you. Uh, and that was just a Tuesday at COP. So th there, were, there were, as Justine says, there were all sorts of announcements in the lead up to this international gathering and then at this gathering, and there was there was uh, really historic announcements on uh, nature protection uh, as a way of uh, getting at uh, uh, locking up more carbon uh, in in the oceans and in, in uh, trees and what have you. Um, as as I said before, there's there's I think maybe because a lot of there's there's a desire at these two two week meetings to to find some drama. There was a lot of there was a lot of coverage of you know which international leaders were showing up was the chinese leader showing up was the indian leader showing up and like i just i i i'm not sure that really mattered at the end of the day um uh, really it was about the announcements in the lead up to and and at the end of the day these leaders have to go home these countries have to go home and deliver real carbon reductions through national legislation uh, so whatever documents were signed at the meeting are aspirational, are about uh, setting sort of global benchmarks, but it's, I, I don't think it's the real kind of meat in the sandwich at the end of the day. Okay. Uh, Catherine, most, uh, most underrated development you saw. So, yeah, I think Justine and Rick have made really great points. I think we did really see this articulation of the need for an all hands on deck approach at COP26, getting a variety of sectors involved. It was a very announcement-oriented COP, which is quite different from other COPs, right? Previously, COPs have been very negotiations, very technically oriented. And COP is in this transition period. So, you know, actually alluding to a previous question that you had, I think it's worth just quickly reflecting on the fact that this is the only international multilateral process that exists of its kind and it exists to talk about the climate crisis. And it is a consensus-based process that brings almost 200 countries of the world together. And so 
doesn't always deliver what it is many of us are looking for it to deliver, uh, but it is a precious process that is unlike any other that exists on the planet. And I think for that very reason, it is a very important one um, that we that we need to value and uh, and figure out how to make what happens at the in these spaces real in the way that Rick were mentioning by making sure it's reflected in domestic policy. Uh, so some of those big announcements included the announcement to, to phase out international public finance for fossil fuels development. And Justine would have been um, involved in those conversations because Canada signed on to that announcement. I think one that didn't get very much attention that was really interesting from my perspective is this effort by Antigua and Barbuda and Tuvalu, so a Caribbean small island nation, a Pacific small island nation, joining forces to register a new commission with the United Nations that would create the possibility for uh, small developing states that are experiencing some of the worst impacts of climate change to claim damages from some of the biggest polluters in the world. And that is a really significant development, right? If, if those legal instruments are going to be turned toward countries being able to claim for those damages, and they specifically pointed out those uh, those large polluters that have a historic responsibility for the problem of climate change because of the use of fossil fuels over, over the last century. Uh, and I think those initiatives that, that maybe got a lot of attention, you know, I, I'm not going to say that they're overrated necessarily, but I think that there are some where we have some really good questions that we need to ask. And, and some of those questions are about accountability and follow-up. So how do we make sure that they're going to do what they say they're going to do? <laughs> And the reason that's important is so that we avoid pitfalls like I think we saw with the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero that Rick mentioned earlier, an amazing initiative to get a whole bunch of financial institutions from the private sector engaged in this conversation committed to Net Zero. And unfortunately, many of those that signed up to that have since signing up to it financed new fossil fuel projects. And so I think a conversation mm -hmm. about, okay, to what extent does signing up to that kind of commitment actually bind you to really changing business as usual is is the, the question that we that we need to answer once we get back home. Got it. So there's an issue of accountability to to the pledges and commitments that you've made um, that have to be covered as well. Uh, Justine? That's right. Yeah, so, um, you know, maybe I'll pick up on that, the, the Japan's alliance, right? I think there was a lot of hype around when we got to COP. We hadn't, you know, we hadn't been able to to collectively come up with the hundred uh, 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 trillion that was required. And I, I honestly think that that was an aspirational goal. And and you know, I will confess, I'm a girl that that comes to the table with a glass half full. Like to me, it's more about putting that money to work and, you know, building the momentum that then brings others than trying to aim for this big number that apparently will solve everything, but not being able to show and to, to demonstrate that you're actually having impact through those commitments. So that for me is one that I think throughout the whole COP had quite a bit of attention, but we also know, you know, with our fellow Canadian, Mark Carney, like that, you know, that was his goal to get as many FIs to sign up on that. And, and he, you know, I took my hat off to him. He made great progress on that to be able to bring that to the table. One area, and I will go about it more from a thematic point of view that I think isn't getting enough attention. Um, mm -hmm. Rick, you commented on it with the biodiversity piece, which was kind of pre-COP, like two weeks before, right? So that didn't get as much, much attention. And that's perhaps the next big, it, it's already here, that crisis, but it's kind of the next one we're really going to have to tackle. For me, it's the interconnectivity between solving for climate and the social considerations, right? Uh, equality, those that have versus those that don't, you know, those that are impacted as a result of these future policy um, uh, decisions that will need to be implemented will impact individuals and how do we kind of make that whole transition a just one? You know, I think it, we're not we're not talking about that enough. And to me, what would be unfortunate is that you, by so, trying to solve climate, you create more inequalities. That to me would not be the right way to do it. So I think we're, and you know, I, I don't want to take away from the urgency of what we have to solve for, but I think sometimes we're almost overly simplistic about let's just do this and everything else will follow. We need to make sure that these transition, and in some countries, us being one out of them, Canada, there are some big impacts. So how do governments really 
factor that in. And I do believe there's mechanisms they can accelerate to be able to bring those two uh, uh, axes together as we work through these problems. So, you know, so we've talked about um, changes. I mean, we're talking about next steps now. That seems to be the focus. It's going to be the focus for the next five, six years. I wonder about colleges and institutes. I mean, they're embedded in communities big and small across the country. Um, there's there's certainly a lot of potential there. We, I'd love to hear some, some ideas from you on on what you see their role being in, in advancing the goal of, of 1.5 degrees and, and other climate commitments that have been made. Um, and, and whoever wants to, to, to start first on that. Rick? Yeah, I mean, maybe I'll jump in. I, uh, and, and maybe I'll sort of go up to the 30,000 foot level a little bit. Uh, one of the things that concerns me about, about climate change at the moment is sort of epitomized by the reaction I get whenever I tell people that I do climate change research for a living. Uh, and this right. happened to me at the barber shop the other day where I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm in the barber chair and the barber says, uh, well, what do you do? And I say, well, I, I research climate change for a living. And he says, you know, right the face, he says, uh, is it true we're all screwed? He says, <laughs> um, and, and I, I don't know if uh, other people have this experience, but, but Quite often, when I tell people I work on climate change, the immediate words out of their mouth are concern, uh, angst, and, and I think there's, there's yeah. a pessimism, and I think there's a kind of a level of doom hanging over this issue that would be uh, helpful to try to dispel, not, not in a sort of Pollyanna way, because I because I, I really do believe that we need to accelerate effort. I mean, what's happening in British Columbia at the moment surely is, is evidence, if we needed any more evidence, that, uh, that we're not doing enough at the moment. We need to accelerate pro progress. Um, but progress is possible. And, and mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, what, what, um, what scientists were telling us 10 years ago uh, where we might end up at the end of the century in terms of warming, those worst case scenarios are now much less likely because we're starting imperfectly, not, not, not fast enough, but we are starting to inflect the carbon curve downward. So we know the progress is possible. We just need to make more of it. So I, uh, I think colleges and universities as educators, as mm. uh, drivers of the local economies have a role to play in, in trying to push this issue towards solutions, positivity, um, and, and to try to dispel this kind of doom and gloom that, that uh, surrounds it too often. Oh, a great start. Uh, Justine, I think I might, may have seen you raising your hand. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no, sure. I think it, it is a great start. Um, so what I'd add to the conversation, so I want to go back to something that uh, one of us was talking about, which is, you know, despite the commitment at COP and all these announcements, you still kind of the next day have institutions that continue to finance fossil fuels. So I go to that and I say, right, you know, it's important to understand the dynamic in, in some of these organizations, right? You could be the chief corporate sustainability officer, and depending how close you are to the business, sometimes mm -hmm. I'll say, unfortunately, you're more in a comms role to kind of, you know, manage what's being said on the outside. But the work in order for the organization to actually embrace this change you know, significant as it is for the individual citizen out there that's trying to do their part, right? So there is a lot of work that has to be done there. My goal with this, or my point in terms of what colleges and universities can do is, to me, it shouldn't be um, the job of the environmental faculty to, or the climate faculty to make sure that they train the very best climate experts in Canada, it is, but it's the job of every faculty to embed mm -hmm. consideration, and I'll say not just for climate, mm -hmm. but for ESG, so that it is part of every student's training and awareness to understand what some of those issues are. You know, the legal faculty will touch human rights. Human rights are intertwined with environmental impacts, right? There's business considerations in terms of if you're gonna be an entrepreneur, how are you gonna factor in climate risk 
and impacts as part of your business model, how you're going to innovate and so forth. And I could go on with many examples. So to me, every faculty has a job to increase the level of awareness of its students. Those faculties that are shaping the leaders of the future, and not that all students can't be leaders, but I mean, you know, in those specific roles, should add even more so that regardless of the organizations they're part of, they have that mindset when they're coming to the table to, to inform or make decisions in regards to the future investment decisions that all these companies are gonna get. So to me, it's everybody's job at the university level um, to be able to incorporate that in the training of our great minds of the future, I would say. You know, there is an opportunity there. I think that's a great idea. I think there, the, that, or oh, great thinking, that there is an opportunity to infuse every sector with that kind of policy thinking. And, and it's actually easier to infuse that kind of thinking if it's happening at that post-secondary level, right? That's, that's, I think that's a great idea. Uh, Catherine, I'll give you the, the, the last word on that before I bring in uh, our three other speakers. Uh, thanks, Manjula, and really great points made by my fellow panelists. So I think what I'll, I'll add to the conversation um, are a few points. First, to, to Rick's point around there being a fair amount of despair and angst uh, out there on climate change, which is totally understandable given, given the very real experience of climate change that we and many communities around the world and here in Canada are having. Um, I, in my experience of 15 years working on climate change, it's been my whole career, that despair often comes through the most when we feel we're in it alone when we feel that taking action on climate change is something that we are individually responsible for, and we lose sight of the fact that this is a collective problem that requires a collective response. And so I, I think my number one message to educators, to colleges and institutes out there, is to help your students understand that it's not on them. It's not on them alone. It is the responsibility of all of us to act on the climate crisis and uh, I, our responsibility as Canadian citizens to use our political power to hold our political decision makers accountable to the need to act on the climate crisis. And so I think a part of it is saying to your students, you know, you are political actors, you have the ability of influencing the political conversation, talk to your elected officials, regardless of their political party, climate change is a nonpartisan issue, make your elected officials know this is something you care about and expect them to take action on. And the other thing I would say is, yeah, we, you know, we, and Justine alluded to this earlier, we're embarking on a huge socioeconomic shift here in Canada and around the world, right? It's not a mediocre undertaking. It is a reimagining of the way that we've done society and economy so far. And we need to do that in a way that makes life better for people, right? It's not just about incremental emissions reductions. It's about making our communities more livable, easier to get around, making our homes more comfortable, warmer, making our energy more affordable. So how do we bring those human pieces into the conversation and make sure that we're taking care of people and community as we make this shift? And it really is the job of colleges and institutions to prepare younger people and, and you know, people who are, are embarking on their careers to contribute to that conversation, both on the side of how we combat climate change, how we keep it from getting as bad as it can be, and on the side of how we adapt to the impacts of climate change that we know are already here and are on the way. Uh, so yeah, so I think there's a lot of hope and um, promise in in young people um, and you know in, in some older generations as well. Uh, and really this is about us understanding we're in it together. Um, and as long as we can stick together and figure out how to do yeah. this as a society, we can get it done. Wonderful. Well, th thank you, Catherine, and, and thank you to all of you for for sharing uh, those insights with us. And and stick around because all of those those um, should I say expectations that you have put forward, I'd love to uh, put to a couple of people in the colleges and institutes com uh, community. So let me introduce our uh, the next three speakers um, on our virtual table. Uh, first, we have Denise Amio, the president and CEO of CI Can. Uh, next, Angus Graham, the president of Selkirk College, and I'm also really pleased to introduce Nidhu Jagoda. She's a student on CI Can's Impact Advisory Committee and, and National Coordinator with the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Um, thank you for joining us. 
I just so froze, Angus. so I'm hoping uh, I'm hoping that was uh, that was uh, me you were introducing. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Thanks, thank you, um, <laughs> Angus. Um, I, I'm going to start with you. Uh, I think I can speak for everyone here. Uh, our thought our thoughts are with you. I know that the Selkirk College community and and really everyone in BC um, have been coping with some very difficult circumstances this month, and you're getting ready for more rainfall over the next week as well. Um, you know, how are you doing and, and how would you describe the mood in the province? Well, thanks for that, Manjula. Yes, uh, um, member institutions within Colleges and Institutes Canada were really affected just with the latest um, atmospheric river and, and the impacts of, um, of an intense rainstorm. And so my, my, uh, our concern is with our colleagues at uh, Nicola Valley Institute of Technology, which um, uh, is still on evacuation. So students and staff, mm -hmm. some of whom have um, had uh, dramatic impacts, lo losing homes and, uh, and possessions and uh, living uh, elements uh, have been really uh, continue to be affected by the floods as well as uh, University of Fraser Valley. And so, um, and that's just the latest. So we've had, as you know, in the last uh, summer, BC had heat domes and and uh, ter a terrible forest fire mm -hmm. season again institutions and campuses had to be um, on alert evacuation alert and in some cases evacuated um, while the fires were were being uh, fought so yeah it's a we i think uh, um, all the panelists are correct i mean the, it's um it's very real for us here in bc mm -hmm. and and uh, institutions will play uh, are continuing to play an important role in bringing um, you know, hope to action and, and uh, some of that um, uh, wonderful sentiments pr provided by the panelists around all the things that we can do to, to bring all hands on deck and really respond to students because um, uh, students are, 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 are wanting this. It's not just about whether the institution should uh, uh, help with the, with the issue or, or develop new curriculum or programs or partnerships. The students are insisting on it and we need to respond. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, as I said before, our thoughts are with you and I hope that it's going to be okay over the next while. Um, and then coming back to this discussion about uh, the role of colleges and institutes when it comes to this, this the, commi the commitments that have been made at, at, at COP, uh, Denise, Nidu, I'll start with you, Denise. You, you know, you were listening to what Justine, Rick, Rick and Catherine were saying. They've set, off, as, as set up some expectations that they would like to see from post-secondary institutions. Uh, I'd love to hear your perspective on, on, on what they have to say. Oh, Denise, I think you're muted. Okay, sorry again. Oh. Um, I should know better, as Rick said earlier. Uh, so I'll go very quickly with the three suggestions. So uh, Rick talked about an awareness campaign. In fact, we recently got funding from uh, the Department of Environment and Climate Change to start such an awareness campaign which mm -hmm. I believe will really help to mobilize all the college system. People may not know, but 95% of Canadians live within 50 kilometers of one of our campus, and 86% of Indigenous live within 50 kilometers of our campus. So we have this powerhouse that is there, uh, whether uh, in rural area, urban, isolated, or northern. Uh, second, with respect to uh, the suggestions of Justine that it is uh, all faculty's responsibility. And in fact, I'm pleased to report that this is exactly what we are doing in most of the institutions, whether people teach culinary arts, and they, they talk about food sustainability, how to ensure you use every piece of food uh, in constructions to ensure that they look at efficiency and also a use of recycled materials or even in the business uh, sector, for example. So, but I, I agree we can do even more. It's important mm -hmm. that, you know, everybody, everybody, uh, all faculty does it. And finally, with uh, the comment from uh, Catherine saying to ensure that people realize that 
they are not alone, they are a collective. And this is why for us it's so important to work together as a group. Uh, that's why we had this uh, statement during COP26 with respect to our collective, uh, uh, not only desire, but commitment to be carbon neutral by 2050. Of course, we want to do it before. And this is certainly something that we, we believe that we'll, with the real estate that we have across the country, there's a lot of potentials, but people often do not realize how we can contribute to reducing GHG. Hmm. Thank you, thank you, Denise, for, for I think uh, for people who do want to see that that press release or any of the reports that that um, um, CI Can has, you can find them on the website. Anithu, I'd, I'd like you to weigh in. You were listening in for the 30 minutes that the panel spoke. Um, do you have any any comments or do you want to share your perspective on, on the thoughts that were shared? Yeah, well, on the topic of um, what colleges, institutions and any other um, higher learning centers can do. A lot of it has to do with professional development help and training, skilling, and equipping these young minds to tackle issues of climate change and these massive, massive problems. A lot of the times uh, these problems are treated in silos. So for a lot of it, you will see the faculty of environment um, you know, train these great thinkers, I think as Justine mentioned, but there's very little um, connection to how that impacts engineering, STEM, social sciences. So all these fields, this needs to be better integrated into the very lace of how these uh, these are taught and, and spoken about. And so there needs to be a better awareness when these you're training young professionals, at least, who are going into the workforce and in the next 20, 30 years are going to be talking and making these changes they need to know what they're going into. I have friends graduating currently that still don't know much about climate change, but they're going to be working professionals in a year or two. And so that that piece, that accountability on the parts of who does what, how are we going to act as a collective, that's not being pushed enough, I feel, across the board in any learning institution I've been at so far. Um, but that's not to say that it can't be done. And conversations like this really do help get that ball rolling. Um, and the other thing was that I, I found that that conversation of COP, um, a lot of the, the narrative of hope is one that's really important to keep. But especially as a young person coming into this, and the further I go in these fields, it's really hard to keep that that positive outlook, especially when you understand the complexity and the depth of the problem we're trying to tackle. Because it's a collective problem, I see so little action. Sometimes it can be hard to see where you fit in. You feel like a piece on a chessboard. And to a lot of young people, they lack that piece of having a voice. So again, like thank you for having me at this panel, but these are the types of opportunities we should be creating for these young people, bright minds who are leaders in their own respect, not only the leaders of tomorrow, they are educated in this field, they know what they're talking about and should have a seat at the table. And I and I and I love the point you you, you made about I, I think you know um, Rick had said it earlier too the the importance by describing the conversation at the at the barbershop but but the but the importance of keeping the conversation optimistic um, I, I think that's that's very important. Thank you for for bringing that up again, um, Angus. I, I'd love for you to reflect on the conversation and perhaps even you know take it a step further and talk about some of the challenges that that institutions face in in helping Canada make the transition that our our first three panelists would like to see us make. Well, thank you. Yeah, and and. Um... You know, I was trying to be a good student during the presentations or the panel discussions, and I wrote some, down so many things because I, I tended to write on the column of opportunities. It's a much longer list than, than, uh, than challenges. And, but there were some really great points made that I think will really help uh, institutions in the future, if not already. But just the idea that um, of colleges and institutes and universities can have a tremendous amount of impact at the local level in terms of, of this idea of um, 
a climate change being an order of principle. I, I love that because it can be an order of principle for the way we design curriculum, the way we partner with mm -hmm. a local business and industry to help them solve some of their challenges. It can be the way we operate our, our campuses or electrify our fleets or um, do our energy uh, emission reductions. And at the college, you know, since 2008, we've managed to bring ours down by almost half just from replacing old equipment. And then we're in the process now of, of, uh, of solar panel installation and, and, and um, um, bioenergy plants. So, you know, there, there's a certain amount you can do just by starting to think about an order of principle in all of the things that you do and then modeling the way in your local communities. Denise shared the statistic, you know, we're, with, we're, we're sort of spread, you have that geograph geographical spread and one of the things that um, one of the panelists was saying was just around how how important it is to to engage people like in the barber shops in the, in the communities at local the local leadership levels through student clubs and groups and through curriculum to to um, kind of increase that climate literacy, but also take it to the next level, which is it's it's a, it's affecting everything that we're we're trying to accomplish here. And so in order for us to continue to be relevant as, as higher education in Canada and a responsive to students and, and um, um, meeting those, that goal of, of a hopeful future. I love what um, uh, Justine said at the beginning, you know, you sort of get excited, then you get inspired, and then you start asking yourself, okay, so what do I got to do now? And mm. I think what, one of the things that, that I'm taking away from today is that the, the, the longer we rely on other people, policymakers or, or um, larger institutions to solve, the, the, we're going to be waiting a while and we just we have that, uh, that urgency now. And with that geographic spread that our member institutions have to work at the local level to get people engaged and, um, and up to speed so that it's not just seen as recycling or, or you know, pr protecting things or it, there's, there's a whole huge ecosystem of how we can move the dial. That's why I, I really appreciated what CI Can has done around the, the sustainability development goals and the work with the McConnell Foundation. Because when you're reducing poverty, you're addressing climate change. When you're building better buildings, you're addressing climate change. When you're protecting marine areas and then training um, the future workforce to help protect those places and manage them properly, you're, you're addressing climate change. So in effect, no one should be left behind. There's just, that shouldn't be the challenge. The opportunity is how to get more people engaged and with the right kind of education and training um, and the right types of applied research and partnerships with business and industry so they can innovate and continue to contribute. Thank so, you. So uh, maybe, maybe, ahead, maybe yeah. I'd like to, uh, I love what you have said, uh, Angus, you're right on. Uh, and what is amazing is that there is this incredible powerhouse across the country, but it could be tapped more. Let me give you mm -hmm. an example. Uh, with the current program on infrastructure, uh, colleges and institutes and also universities right now we're not eligible for the funding to for deferred maintenance when in fact we could improve tremendously uh, with respect to energy efficiency but we don't have access to that funding right now the the second thing is that we have across the country centers of applied research to work with small and medium business communities. And in fact, 100 of those centers specialize in sustainable development. So think about all aspects of sustainable development. But the, the, the funding we're getting, it represents only 2% of the entire funding in applied in, in research right now. And so there's much, much more potential where you could tap on those resources. And when we talked about mobilization, there, there is the mobilizations of students, but also their faculty, but also people living in those communities. 
So there, as I said earlier, there is this powerhouse and that's just waiting to, to be uh, encouraged to pursue uh, in, in all those aspects. And also in another one that nobody has talked about yet, and is the shortage of skilled people that know about mm -hmm. those uh, areas that kn mm -hmm. have the know-how and we are able to do micro credentials we're able to do different types of courses of a different duration and so my request to all of you and you may want to comment on that what can you do to help us to share that story? Um, so I'd love to hear your, your suggestions or your insights. Well, I'll say that we, we have about two minutes left, so I can take one comment on that. And I, and I think it's a really important point, Denise, because I, I should specify there's, there's 670 colleges, SAGEPs, uh, polytechnics and institutes across the country. They are uh, really embedded. Some of them are, are the equivalent of community hubs. So I think that there is promise there. We also know uh, I was reading a, a, a labor market report recently, and, and, it, and it says that by in the next decade, there are going to be a quarter of a million green jobs created. Well, who are going to fill these jobs and who can suddenly develop the, the curriculum to meet those? So, uh, you know, perhaps uh, I, I, I will give the last word. I'm going to pick completely randomly. Rick. You get the last word in uh, as a response to Denise's question about about uh, meeting about about leveraging the colleges and institutes uh, community to to help in making the transformation, helping Canada make that transformation. You're muted again. Nice try. <laughs> I mean, how many times? The, um, uh, Maybe I'll, I'm, I'm going to chicken out a little bit. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of a lot of things I could say, but I just want to talk about timeline for a second, just because I, I don't think we can ever talk about the climate issue without underlining the urgency of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, that is one of the fundamental defining aspects of this issue. You know, not only do we need to find solutions, we need to do it quickly. And mm -hmm. uh, in, in our country, I just wanted to underline the importance of the next six months. Um, we have a new, as Catherine, as, as Catherine mentioned, we have a new uh, net zero emissions uh, uh, accountability act. The government, our, our federal government for the first time in our country's history is uh, mandated to deliver to the country a 2030 emissions reduction plan that is supposed to happen in the next few months. Uh, that plan is supposed to actually have some detail uh, in terms of uh, regulations, in terms of expectations. Um, so I, as a, as a way of answering one aspect of Denise's question, I just wanted to underline the, the importance of the next half year, the next year in the life of this debate. And uh, rather than colleges and universities going off and like dreaming up fabulous, complicated things to do, uh, we just need to start doing things and uh, mm -hmm. we need to do them quickly. And I'd, I'd rather the, uh, I'd rather imperfect things quickly than incredibly complicated things two years from now. Perfect. That is agility. I that is I think I think on an individual level, um, institution level, and as a country, I think that's a fantastic point to end it on. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Rick, for letting me put you on the spot um, and a great response to that. Uh, and thank you to all of you. I, I just wanna say that there have been, I, I wanna share a couple of things because CICAN has been in the news lately. Uh, in the run up to uh, to COP, Canada's public colleges, SAGEPs, polytechnics and institutes pledged to do their part to tackle the climate crisis and achieve net zero emissions by 2050 on their campuses. For more on that pledge, please consult the press release that was uh, published by CICAN. CICAN encourages all of its members to showcase what they're already doing, share examples of their projects and initiatives uh, aimed at reducing their carbon footprint by using the hashtag uh, climate, climate action. So the hashtag climate action. And then there's a second piece of news. One year after signing up to the United Nations um, SDGs, a Sustainable Development Goals, CICAN published its first report this September to mark 
Global Goals Week, in which the association explains how its many programs, activities, and partnerships contribute to the achievement of, uh, of the S SDGs in Canada and abroad. The report focuses on the key objectives that inspired the CICAN strategic plan, decent work and economic growth, reducing inequality, gender equity, climate action, and quality education. The latter, of course, is the central theme for CICAN. I'm sure you're interested in uh, reading that report. You can find that report on the CICAN website. Um, and you know what? For such updates, you don't have to wait for this conversation and this lovely um, live get together that we do once a month. There is another way to know all about the key initiatives in place within and for post secondary, uh, for post secondary education led by CICAN, by the government and other national and international stakeholders. Subscribe to the CICAN's bi monthly newsletter and hey, it's free. Uh, it's titled Perspectives. Have a look. Um, I think we had the email up uh, where you can subscribe. Wow, I just, that was such a fascinating discussion and we could have gone on for another hour, um, but you know what? We wanna hear your perspective. Send us your questions and your comments um, on today's discussion, things that you may have seen or you're doing uh, on your campuses that may be interesting to, to everyone here. Um, you can send that to the email address that's on the screen now. I wanna say a big thank you to our guests. Um, some of them probably still have jet lag, uh, Justine, Hendricks of Export Development Canada, Rick Smith of the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices, Catherine Abro of Destination Zero, Angus Graham of Selkirk College, and Nidhu Jagoda of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And of course, uh, Denise Amio, President and CEO of CICAN. We'll be back next month, uh, Wednesday, December the 15th for the next episode of Perspectives Live. Crucial topic, Indigenous rights are human rights. Thank you for joining us today and stay safe.